So let's give one great big cheer right now for one of the finest Republican leaders I think I've ever met in this state, Auditor Tom Schweik. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much. You want to wrap this evening. What a warm welcome. You know, uh, four years ago, thanks to you, I became the first Republican to defeat a Democrat incumbent in a statewide race in 34 years. And it would not have happened without people in this room. Two weeks ago, I became the first Republican not to draw any Democrat opponent in a statewide race in 144 years. And when I look around this room and I see Susie and Ron Johnson, Kim Costu, Jack and Arlene Jackson, Jane and Gary Cunningham, Doc Brown, Joy Gerstein, all the people that jumped on with me very, very early on, I say thank you because I would not be here without you, and thank you so much. You helped get me elected, and you're helping keeping me in office. Thank you very much. Now, when I became state auditor, the job had been held by Democrats for 12 years, including eight years of Claire McCaskill. Yeah. The office needed some work. So I did what I always do when I get into a new situation. I asked the career people, some of them have been there for 30 years, what can we do to deliver better audit services to the people of Missouri? Now the state auditor audits state agencies, boards, commissions, cities, counties, school districts, elected officials. We do not audit private citizens. We do not audit private corporations. Our job is to be your taxpayer watchdog. First thing the career people told me was, Sometimes, when we get to a place and there's a wrongdoer, somebody ruining your, your situation, wasting your tax dollars, taking advantage of the taxpayer, they've destroyed the evidence by the time we get there. So I said, let's have a rapid response team. I hired Daryl Moore out of Green County, former prosecutor, 12 years. I said, Daryl, when we get credible evidence that a public official is stealing money and destroying that evidence, we want to be able to move in there within 24 hours, issue subpoenas, get the wrongdoer out of there, and get that person taken care of. So what we did, the first time that happened, just a few weeks after we instituted the rapid response team, we got a call from a, t a teacher in St. Louis City who said there's a principal who's gotten all kinds of awards for improving attendance of inner city students and all kinds of accolades. The teacher said it's all a huge problem. What's really going on is we fill out manual attendance slips, and then we turn them into the principal, and she enters them all the absent students in the computer as present. And she's doing that to make herself look better, but it's also a financial crime, because if you have higher attendance than you really have marked down, you get more money from the state. So we executed nine subpoenas, removed the principal. By the time we got there, after only 24 hours, the principal had destroyed two-thirds of the manual attendance slips, but we got one-third of them. Proved a massive attendance fraud and just two months ago, the city of St. Louis refunded $145,000 of your taxpayer money back to the state treasury. <laughs> We've done the rapid response three other times, and in each case we found a major fraud. So that's working. The next thing we put in place was a grading system. No one had ever graded public officials spending your taxpayer money. How many here are teachers? You know, people do better when they're graded. Now, everybody gets an excellent, a good, a fair, or a poor under very specifically defined criteria. And that way, you don't have to wade through a 100 or 200 page audit. You can see right very quickly how are these people performing and hold them accountable in the next election. So the grading system has worked well. The media likes it, too, because the audits are long. They're complex. Now they get to say, so-and-so got a good rating, so-and-so got a poor rating. Now they know, and they can explain it to you easier. We put in a follow-up team. No one had ever followed up on the audits. Now, if you get a bad grade on our system, we come back 90 days later, we do another audit and make sure those recommendations are fully implemented and all the problems are fixed. No one had ever done that before. Now, we have a situation where the auditees actually want the follow-up because if we give them a bad grade, you know, they've they got an election coming up or something, they want to improve. We did the audit of the Rockwood School District, the third largest in the, in the state. 
We found 25 major problems, conflicts of interest. We had people on the board who were giving contracts to themselves, terrible things. We did not have the St. Louis City Schools. We found illegal social promotion going on there. And under Missouri law, if you are a fourth grader going to fifth grade, all you have to do is read at a third grade level. The city of St. Louis was promoting kids, 700 kids a year that couldn't even read at a first grade level. We said that's not allowed under Missouri law. You've got to stop that. They were supposed to monitor test cheating. You know, there's a lot of test cheating going on these days. They said they had 400 monitors. Well, we asked for the monitor slips. They can only produce 100 of them. Where were the rest? Where were the rest? So we got in there, and we said, you are going to need to improve this. And in each case, those school districts put on their website every recommendation we made, and you could follow during the 90-day period before we came back, and they implemented them one by one by one, and by the time we got there, all of the problems have been fixed. So the follow-up team is working for you, and that's what we put in place. And the last thing we did, you know my background. Now, about half of our auditors over the years have had a law enforcement background, a half an accounting background. Here, Margaret Kelly was a great accountant. She was a great state auditor. Kit Bond and John Ashcroft were state auditors. They had the more law enforcement background. My background is in law enforcement. I've been a federal prosecutor, United States Ambassador for Justice Reform in Afghanistan. I had the honor of working on anti-corruption at the UN with John Bolton, and there was a lot of corruption we found there, a whole lot. He'll tell you a little more about that later, I think. Uh, but my background has always been in law enforcement. I think the worst thing you can do, if you are a public official charged with spending taxpayer money, is steal the money. So the first thing I said I want to do is find the crooks. We put in an anti-embezzlement program. Everybody in our office, all 120 people in four cities, are trained to spot somebody stealing your money. I think I talked a little bit about this last year. First thing we look for is closed loop accounting. Everybody knows your collector can tell you. You don't have the same person bring in the money, deposit the money, get the bank statement, do the reconciliation, keep the delinquency records. No closed loop accounting. Everyone knows it's accounting 101. You don't do that. So we look for that when we go in. Second thing we look for, embezzlers never take a vacation, ever, because they don't want anybody else to look at the books. So we look at the leave records, and if somebody has closed loop accounting, and they haven't taken a vacation for 11 years, they're either a really good public servant or they're stealing your money, okay? One or the other. The next thing we look for is embezzlers, they always feel guilty. So they give out a lot of expensive gifts to co-workers, charities. There was an embezzler who recently stole $3.4 million from St. Louis County. He made $80,000 a year. He gave a $250,000 donation to the zoo. Now, how do you do that on $80,000 a year? You know who does something like that? An embezzler does something like that, and he got caught $3.4 million. There was a clerk in Pineville, Missouri, in far southwest Missouri, made $18,000 a year, got two new cars in one year. You know who does that? An embezzler does that, stole $18,000. So when, by the time you get to number five or six on our list, it is guaranteed you got somebody stealing your money. And I'm proud to say that since taking over as your state auditor three and a half years ago, we have found 25 public officials around Missouri stealing money. We've identified the exact official in 22 cases. All 22 have lost their jobs. 14 have been charged with crimes. Eight have already been convicted. The worst of them, the Schuyler County collector, had a scheme to steal money from farmers. You know what she did? She, farmers a lot of times pay their taxes in cash. She would pocket the cash, and she would mark them delinquent on the tax book give them a receipt that said they had paid, and keep the tax delinquency book in her safe, which she guarded because she never took a vacation. Um, when we got there, she thought it was going to be fine. All the books balance, right? Every time there's missing money, there's a delinquency. Well, we have another indicator, which is relative performance of counties. And we know, in a typical rural county, there's about a 9 or 10 percent delinquency rate. She had a 29 percent delinquency rate. So that was an immediate indicator something was wrong. So we went to the people who said, who were supposedly delinquent, and they had their receipts, they paid their taxes. And then we knew. So we confronted her, and this goes to the entitlement mentality. You see, I think it starts all the way at the top of the president. There's this sense of entitlement. We said, what do you have to say for yourself about the fact you just stole $568,000 from the farmers of Missouri? And she said, can we keep this quiet so I can get another job? <laughs> True story. She does have another job, making license plates, 33 months in the federal penitentiary. <laughs> In this state, because of the good staff we have, because of the hard-working group we have, and because of your support, people know you steal money, you're going to jail. It's as simple as that. And everybody's on notice of that, and we're going to continue to look for that. So that's what we've tried to do. That's what I've tried to do as your state auditor over the past three and a half years. Now, 
We've got an election coming up in 2014. I'm honored to be at the top of the ticket for the first time in 14 years. I did not, I, I did not expect, I did not expect that I would go without any Democrat opponent, but I'm still going to run the campaign because we've got a lot of other important elections to win, and I'm at the top of the ticket, and I want to pull the whole ticket up, so I still will be running a campaign. I've been traveling all around the state. This is my 20th Lincoln Day, and I'm going to do another 10 or 15 more. I want people to vote Republican up and down the line across the state, and I'll be campaigning very aggressively for them. Now, as Republicans, we have to stand, obviously, for our core values. We are for smaller government, lower taxes. We are virulently pro-life. We will always be for the Second Amendment. We stand for those things, and we have to continue to stand for those things. But there's some other things that we can do, I think, to help our chances in 2014, because the Democrats have given us an opening. The first thing I think we need to be is the party of integrity. When the President of the United States will look you in the eye and say, if you want to keep your health care, you can keep it, and he knows it is not true. When he says, if you want to keep your doctor, you can keep him or her, and he knows it's not true. When the IRS is saying, we aren't targeting conservatives, and they know it isn't true. When they say Benghazi was some spontaneous uprising, and they know it isn't true, that is a lack of integrity. And we as Republicans have to say, we will never show a lack of integrity. We will always tell the truth. We will never act like the Democrats, and you will get the true story from us. We have to be the party of integrity. The next thing we have to be is the party of competence. Now, Obamacare is a terrible law, but what about the robot? It was the single most incompetent act of the government probably in a hundred years. That's an opening. When I was growing up, my dad said to me, you got Jimmy Carter, incompetent. Ronald Reagan, competent. There was always this sense that the Republican Party knows what it's doing. And now, with the incompetence of the Obama administration in almost every area, people are looking for people who go in and do the job and do it well. And we have to tell people, you elect Republicans, you will get competence. Look at our state. I did an audit not too long over the state's welfare program. Temporary assistance to needy families. Temporary families. You have to have kids. And temporary means you have to be looking for a job. I found thousands of people cashing their welfare checks at casinos in the Virgin Islands, in Hawaii, in Texas. Doesn't sound like they think it's temporary, doesn't sound like they need it. Well, we don't know, you have to go check. It could be some reason why somebody had to be in the Virgin Islands. I don't know, I can't think of what it would be, but it would be something. But what we asked the state agency in charge of administering that is what is your program for identifying suspicious transactions, going in and finding if these people really are illegally taking advantage of the welfare system? Well. We kind of get these manual printouts, and we don't really have any way to tell. Well, we showed them how to enter them in a database, how to do data searches. I mean, this is like what 16-year-olds do on Google every day. They did not know how to do it in the Nixon administration. It was incompetence. And we have to tell people that when we run the state house or the presidency or anything in this country, we will do it with competence. Always. And, and the Democrats will take advantage of the system every time. You know, remember, Governor Nixon said recently, I can't afford to fund education. And he went and bought himself a $6 million plan. I mean, I think as his new education program ought to be. He buses four or five-year-old kindergarten students to the Jefferson City Airport and lets them count all the planes. That's how they can learn how to count. That's your $6 million program. <laughs> we did a usage study. He has five other planes that were not being used. There was 113 days where none of the five other planes were being used. And then he had to buy himself a new one for $6 million instead of giving money to our kids for education. This is what we have to fight against, incompetence and a lack of integrity. The last thing we need to stand for, I think, as a party, is we have to be more disciplined. There's an area where we have a little work to do. In 2012, we lost five out of six statewide elections. We are a conservative state. Missourians agree with us. We should never be losing these statewide elections. And they win because they're a little more disciplined than we are. First, what the Democrats do is they run like Republicans. They don't talk about Obamacare, Medicaid, they don't talk about anything, and then they govern like Democrats. We have to call them out when they do that. They are not Republicans. They are liberals. They do not stand for our values, and we will not let them get away with it. We have to point out that we stand for the values of Missouri. They have a script. We have values. Theirs is a script. Ours are values. Pro-life, pro-gun, pro 
propose smaller government, smaller and lower taxes. Those are the things we have to stick to. The other thing the Democrats have ability to do, though, is they're, they are able to unite behind their strongest candidate. And they don't worry about the factions. We were fighting, we had tea partiers saying, I don't like establishment, I don't like Christian conservatives, rhinos, this or that. That's how we lose elections. Every person in this room is better for America than Barack Obama. Everybody. Everybody in this room is better for Missouri than Jay Nixon. We have to unite around the strongest candidate that we can get to win those elections because we're all better than they are. And then the last part of discipline, I think, is we need to focus very much on 2014. Now, every year I've been in politics, politicians get up here and say, this is the most important election of your lifetime. You know, always hear that, right? <laughs> Well, I will be honest with you. 2014 is probably not the most important election of your lifetime. 2016 will be more important. But that's kind of me like saying 1774 was not as important as 1776. It's true, but look what happened in 1774. The Continental Congress met for the first time. The word liberty first appeared on a flag of the colonists in 1774. The colonists took arms against the British fort for the first time ever in 1774. We would not have had 1776 had it not been for 1774. And I view, I view 2014 like 1774. We have veto-proof majorities in the Missouri House and the Missouri Senate. We have to protect those veto-proof majorities with everything we have. Fight hard for that. I need to get re-elected. I think that's looking pretty good right now. Uh, if I mess this one up, you shouldn't have me back next year. I'm telling you. Uh, but we have veto-proof majorities. We have really important county and local races. There's some really important swing races and county executive races across the state. We need to focus like a laser beam on 2014. If we win all those elections in 2014, fight for our candidates in 2014, by the time we get back to 2016, we will win all the statewide races. They'll have to invent a new shade of red to describe Missouri, and we will be on a roll to making Missouri the most Republican state in the union. I'm committed to it. I hope you're committed to it. It is an honor to serve you, and I look forward to seeing you on the campaign trail. Thank you very much.